Hi students, welcome back. This is chapter 7 for Master Budgeting. The basic framework of budgeting is really no different than a budget you and I might make for our own personal finances. It's a detailed quantitative plan for acquiring and using financial and other resources over a specified forthcoming time period. And really, that's just a fancy way of saying a summary of the likely income and expenses in a period of time. Just like handling our own personal finances and making sure the wages we bring home can cover things like food and clothing and entertainment, companies must also make a plan on the revenues they plan to make and then the expenses incurred with those revenues. Not only does it give the company an understanding of how money will be made and spent, it will also lay the foundation of how to control expenses as they're making a profit. The best budgets will not only plan and develop goals, but they'll also properly control and make sure that the plan is being executed or modified as situations change. So there's two main points here when we're making our budgets. We want to not only plan and develop objectives for our various budgets, but we also want to control we want to make sure that we have steps taken so that we can increase the likelihood that those objectives that we made are actually attained. The advantages of budgeting go beyond just knowing where the money is made and spent. It also helps define goals, um, plan further into the future strategically and understand the resources needed to obtain goals. It might uncover bottlenecks or sources of problems. Um, it could become the catalyst to coordinate of activities, and it's actually a great way of communicating plans and goals throughout the organization. Unfortunately, most organizations utilize top-down budgets. Top-down is just a common term in the industry that means there's direction coming from high up the chain like senior management with little or no input from the rest of the organization. And usually these types of budgets are profit driven. Management will set a target without getting buy in from the production floor or sales staff, and it's really impossible for those targets to be met. The pressure to achieve the targets will be felt across the organization with increased strain and decreased motivation. It's really a poor practice all around. Instead, it's really ideal for what we call a self imposed budget process. And self-imposed budget, or a participated budget, is a budget that is prepared with the full cooperation and participation of managers at all levels. And that's key. It's all levels. It's supervisors. It's middle management. It's top management. It's everybody. This way, everyone signs up for the budgets that are created and are well aware of the goals set before them. The term master budget is a bit misleading is really not a single budget. Instead, it's many budgets that are all driven by each other. And that sounds complicated, but it really does not have to be. Let's think about this in terms of your own personal budgets at home. So your budget at home is driven by the amount of money you make, whether that's a job or if you're living off school loans or maybe you get a social security check, things like that. Your budget is driven by how much money you get. So depending on how much money you make monthly, you will spend accordingly on the essentials you need, such as maybe food or um, your rent for where you live or your mortgage or the kind of car you drive, the amount of gas you put in, your car. All that is driven by the amount of money that you make, your income. If you made $10,000 a month, that's a pretty good salary. If you made $10,000 a month, you probably live in a really nice house and you spend a good chunk of your money on your mortgage for that house. So that mortgage or the rent you're paying, that's a budget in itself. It has its own budget. The amount of money spent on the essentials or entertainment, whatever it may be, the amount you put into savings, all those things, they're going to impact your cash budget. And that's its own budget. All these things are their own budget, but they're all interconnected. Savings it has its own budget. Your entertainment might have its own budget. All these things have their own budget, but they all comprise of your master budget. So let's revisit the actual master budget of an organization. The sales budget, just like the income you would have for your own personal budget, the sales budget will be the driving force for all other budgets. And here it is at the very top. 
Depending on how much sales we budget, we will need to produce a certain amount of goods or services. And that will drive the production budget. Production will drive the budget for our amount of inventory, direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. All of those are connected and driven by how much we have to produce. And again, those are all separate budgets. They're separate schedules, but they're all driven by each other. All of those different budgets, they're all going to affect cash. That is, how much we actually have in our bank account. Think back upon your financial accounting days in your prior class. Sales will directly impact the income statement, and cash will directly impact the balance sheet. So once we have our cash, we can budget for our income, and we can budget for what kind of assets we have. We're going to explore variances in future chapters, but it's noteworthy at this point to add that budgets hold us accountable for what we said would happen. Now, if we don't perform as we said, if we don't perform like we had budgeted for, then there must be some analysis done to understand the variances from the budget to what actually happened. This way we can learn from our mistakes and we can understand what is driving the differences and control our budget better in the future. Okay, so here's a, a little variance analysis we can do. Let's say you made an entertainment budget this month of $200, but you spent $300. Why was there an unfavorable variance of $100? Well, either you went out more often and you had a usage variance, or the things you did just cost more than you thought they would. You have a cost variance. We're going to explore all the different types of budgets that go into the master budget and what they are. Don't get too bogged down in the weeds. We're just going to talk about them at a high level and then do an exercise afterwards. And if you like puzzles, you're going to like fitting the pieces together between all the budgets, since they're all interconnected. The sales budget is the foundation for the master budget and has the monthly unit and dollar sales. This is going to drive everything else. The schedule of cash collections is based on the sales budget and is used to plan when we expect collections from our customers. We don't always get paid from our customers in the same month that the sales take place. Sometimes it takes our customers a month or two to send in their check. So that's why you see that 70% of April sales are collected in April and 25% of April sales are collected in May. We use the sales from the sales budget to complete this schedule. We've completed the sales budget and the schedule for cash collections, so we can move on to the production budget. The production budget must be adequate to meet the budgeted sales and to provide for the desired ending inventory. We want to be able to satisfy the expected sales for the month, but we also want to have an ending inventory balance so that we can cover the sales in the first part of the next month. So production budget will calculate the amount that we need to produce to cover the sales, the ending inventory we wish to have, and of course we can take out the beginning inventory we started with. That way we can figure out how much we actually need to produce for each month. Remember that the ending inventory of one month is the beginning inventory of the next. So March 31st inventory will become April's beginning inventory. If we want an ending inventory balance to be 20% of next month's sales, so in this case May sales, we want to have a 20% ending inventory in April equal to 20% um, of May's sales, then we just need to multiply the next month's sales by the desired percentage and make sure we have a produced enough to cover that amount. And again, the ending inventory of one month is the beginning inventory of the next. This seems very logical, but students have a tendency to forget. Once we have the production budget, we can budget for the materials that must be purchased to produce our calculated number of units. 
So we would use the production numbers that we just took from the production budget and multiply it by the number of materials that we need for each unit of production. Do the same thing we did for the production budget. We'd add in how much we desire to have an ending inventory and subtract what we started with. So we know how much we need to purchase. Like the schedule of cash collections we used with the sales budget, the schedule of cash disbursements goes along with the direct materials budget. And this schedule helps us plan for the amount of cash we need to pay our suppliers each month. Typically businesses want to hold their cash until the invoice comes due. So even though we may have received the materials we need, we don't actually want to disperse our cash um, until it, it comes time to actually pay it out. So usually our cash is not dispersed in the same month in which we receive our materials. So in this case, we have April purchases of $56,000. We're going to pay 50% of that in April and 50% of that in May for April's purchases. Remember our three main product costs from the beginning of this entire class. There's direct material, direct labor, and overhead. We just did the direct materials budget, so now we must do the direct labor budget. Since it's direct labor, we know exactly how many hours are needed to produce each unit. So again, we'll use our, our production budget to put in the number of units we want to produce, and we can multiply that by the number of hours we need, and we can use our wage rate to be able to produce a direct labor budget. And we also need to do a budget for manufacturing overhead. We apply a predetermined overhead rate to calculate the cost. And in this case, it's $20 for every direct labor hour. We haven't talked much about selling and administrative expense in this course, but we also must budget for it in our master budget. And some companies call it SG&A, or sales in general and administrative expenses. This is comprised of all of those period costs, things that don't go into the manufacturing process. Since we've already made a schedule for cash collections and cash disbursements, we can use that information to produce a cash budget. Don't get hung up in the weeds on these budgets. You won't be asked to actually produce the entire cash budget, but it's really good to understand what it is. Once the cash budget is complete, our last steps are budgeted financial statements. The budgeted income statement will use the sales information from the sales budget and the selling and administrative expense budget information to produce a budgeted income statement. By now you can see how all these budgets are interconnected. The budgeted income statement is a great benchmark not only to inform investors of expectations, but to set a goal for the company. And lastly, we can complete a budgeted balance sheet. We can find the ending balance amounts from our direct materials budget, our cash budget, cash collections for accounts receivable, and production budget to complete this budget. It too is used for benchmarking and measuring the company's performance by comparing the actuals to the plan. And here you see our ending inventory balances that it's calculating. Again, don't get too caught up in trying to figure out where all this information comes from. We're going to stick with the very basic budgets that we talked about the first few, like the sales and the production budget. And we won't go into details on this budgeted balance sheet and the budget income statement because, frankly, we don't have all the information we really need to be able to produce them. I'm going to post a separate video walking through an entire actual budget, so you look for the second video to help you through your homework.